let's come back to the insulin resistance piece and let's get into the physiology. Talk about what happens when somebody consumes carbohydrates or sugar. We'll start with blood sugar rising and, and get into the insulin. When you're not insulin resistant and you're an athletic individual, you actually need a lot of carbs. Why? Because carb is the primary source of muscles, immediate energy source. Uh, sometimes I will joke with my patients. I'm like, are you into marathon? I know they are 250 pounds. I'm like, do you run marathons? They'll say no. Um, well, do you exercise two hours a day? They'll say no. And I'm like, what do you eat the carbs for? What is that cereal for? Because if you eat that cereal, uh, your body needs to use that energy right away. If you're going to go for a marathon, yeah, you need that. But if you don't, it's going to go to fat. And what happens when that goes to fat? Your fat cells, they don't proliferate. They don't multiply. They stay in the same number. So whatever the fat cells you have in your two-year-old, you have the same number of fat cells. They just grow. And I tell them, look, in this room, there's you and I here. What if I put you, bring 10 more people in this small room? How would you feel? They'll say, oh, well, I can't even breathe. Well, that's how your fat cells feel like. You're packing all this fat from unused glucose turning into fat, and then your fat cells grow and grow and grow, and they start secreting inflammation signals. It's like you yelling here, hey, save me. You know, I'm, I'm dying. There's no air here. And your fat cells are the exact same thing, releasing all the cytokines, inflammatory markers, and then that makes you insulin resistant because then those inflammation will prevent the insulin from its doing its job. Think like a bunch of gunk coming out and blocking the receptors of all the inflammation, disturbing the receptors. Now insulin cannot attach those receptors because of the inflammation released from the fat cells. So the process starts from, so if you're an athletic individual, you're not overweight and you exercise and your cholesterol looks great, you have a high HDL, low triglyceride, you work out every day, guess what? Eat your banana, eat your cereal, go ahead because you're burning it because if you're athletic and you're going to burn, and if you don't eat carbs, you're going to feel extremely fatigued. So that's why people on carnivore and keto, we don't recommend them like intense exercise because they can't simply do it. Your body needs carbs to exercise for athletic purposes. But if you're not the type of person who does the, all these things, there is no point of consuming all those carbs. It's going to turn into fat and it's going to come back and haunt you. All right, let's come back to the physiology piece of the fat cell growing, causing inflammation, gunking up the insulin receptor. What happens to your body at that point? The way I understand it, when that starts happening, you're going to make more insulin and try and drive that glucose into the cell, even though it's not wanting it. But I'll have you explain the nuances there. It's more than that, actually. So it's a very simple explanation where insulin uh, cannot get into cells. But what happens is insulin can get into other receptors. So when there's a lot of... So you, you knock on one door, that neighbor doesn't turn, respond to the door, but next neighbor may respond to the door. Now, the same insulin will go and activate other things. Like in females, for example, it will activate androgen receptors and they are going to create a lot of testosterone and that will create PCOS, or a uh, uh, ovarian syndrome, where insulin ins excessive insulin is leading to excessive androgen formation like testosterone formation in, in females. Now, that's one problem. Another problem insulin can cause is it activates renin angiotensin system in the body, which is the primary driver of endothelial dysfunction. Now, what is endothelial dysfunction? Endothelium is the lining on the surface of your arteries. So the problem with the atherosclerosis, which is clogging of the arteries, all starts with endothelial dysfunction. And for that to happen, you have to have renin angiotensin system overactivation, which we call mineralocorticoid receptor overactivation, which results in endothelial dysfunction and then think like cracks on your walls in your house, basically, right? So it can leak, you know, the humidity and all sorts of uh, fungi, you know, all sorts of problem mold, right? So that's what's happening to your arteries. And then all this LDL, the pesky LDLs get into your endothelial cells. They start growing. Macrophages start attacking that because they said, wait a minute, you're not supposed to be here. What are you doing in my house? 
get out of here. Now, macrophages start swallowing LDL. Uh, and then that and every time there's a macrophage, like a sinus inflammation, you're going to have mucus coming out of everywhere. That's the inflammation um, byproduct. So as a result, that triggers more inflammation and immune system goes into a frenzy and suddenly platelets come there. Everybody comes there. It's like there's an accident. You see ambulance, you see everybody, and suddenly the whole road is freaking blocked and nobody's going anywhere. Now, if you're going from here to Miami, you see that every day. <laughs> So it's really, that's what's happening in your artery. These are the arteries of the cities, the same thing you're causing. Think like if you have potholes in your, in your highways, that's going to create accidents and suddenly all these inflammation markers, all the ambulance and the police and everybody will be there and then suddenly the road is blocked, you're not going anywhere. That's what's causing the heart attacks at a very early stage, even way before diabetes is diagnosed. So insulin, yes, insulin, you're insulin resistant for glucose, but a lot of other tissues are still sensitive to insulin. And what's interesting, fat cells continues to become more responsive to insulin than the muscle cells. So as a result, what's happening is you have all those glucose running in your system. They are not going to the muscle because muscle is more insulin resistant than the fat, but the fat says, you know what? Come on in. We have more room to grow. Come on in here. So insulin keeps packing the glucose into fat cells, and that creates more problems. It's like you have someone on the door at the, at the gate in a club, and then the guy says, yeah, come on in, come on in. The guy's inside says, wait a minute, this is getting too crowded here. But the guy at the, the, guy at the gate says, oh, you need to make more money. Come on in, you know. They just keep get in the club. Everybody in there is dying, but the guy at the front says, keep coming in. That's what's happening with the fat cells you know, insulin still packing glucose into fat cells, whereas, you know, across the street, you know, the, the healthy salad bar is not getting anything. Now, there's no customers there because, you know, that, that they, um, they are more resistant to the action of these people going in. So uh, the body works uh, weird in a way that the insulin resistance is not the same in every tissue, and that's a big problem. Let's talk about what the body does when it comes to making more insulin, when insulin resistance starts. Well, anytime there's a resistance, you have, you, you, your body does anything to overcome it because glucose is a vital, uh, most important nutrient in your system that needs to be utilized. Otherwise, it goes into pathways. If it doesn't go through the right way, it goes the wrong way. Like if you're... If your son doesn't go to the college, he may go join a gang, right? So there's different pathways people take. And glucose, if it doesn't go the right way, it's going to go to the different pathways that creates inflammation or more inflammation. And body knows that and wants to increase the insulin so the glucose can be utilized. But with the expense of causing more damage to other tissues, think like you're, if your door is kind of a rusty and you want to open it, and then you're pushing it hard to open it because there's resistance at the door. And then you're pushing it so hard that it eventually opens and you hit something and now you broke something else. So insulin resistance trying to, insulin increases trying to achieve to keep the glucose levels normal. But while doing that, it's causing all the other damage in the other organs. Got it. And then where my mind goes next is the fact that what a lot of doctors do when they get to that point is they put patients on insulin and we're further putting logs on the fire and continuing that cycle. Talk about how you think about that. Right. So actually there has been a paradigm shift in that approach. Um, we used to say, oh, go ahead and start insulin because you have to bring the blood sugars on the point. The point of that is we don't want kidney disease, we don't want eye disease, because we know when there's too much glucose and your body cannot compensate for the ex extra insulin, then you have to give the insulin to keep the glucose down. So what you're doing is keeping the glucose down, but you're not preventing the damage that the same thing happens without insulin, giving insulin from outside. If, even if your body makes the insulin or you are taking the insulin from outside, the damage still happens to other organs. Now, yes, you are fixing the glucose. You may be preventing kidney disease. You may be reducing the risk of eye disease. But guess what? We found out 
that they die from heart attack and stroke way before they even develop kidney disease. We call them, they're lucky if they go to dialysis because most of them will die from heart attacks because of the insulin or they will develop cancer because of the insulin before they even lose their eye. Like there's not that many people losing their eye from diabetes, but two thirds of diabetics die from heart attacks and strokes because of insulin resistance. So that defeats the purpose. And yeah, you know, you're trying to save, you know, you're trying to make an investment that you will make, uh, you know, a dollar from $10, but then you're actually losing $5 like months before you make a dollar. So then there's no point of investing in something like that. So it's a bad investment. So you're trying to control something and breaking something bigger. Now, for that reason, I'm mean, from a medication standpoint, right? So I'm, I'm a holistic guy. I do medications and supplements and lifestyle change all has to be together. But from a medication standpoint, they realized that and they came up with uh, 10 years ago or so with the GLP-1 agonist agents. Now, what these are, these are actually intestinal hormones, like you, you heard the, you know, the, the talk recently about semaglutide, the Ozempic, and Trulicity, or Mongero. They're gastrointestinal hormones that gives you the appetite uh, or, you know, the, um, the satiety signals. And that tells your body that there is food in your system, so calm down, don't eat. Now, these, and these medications also have been shown to reduce the risk of heart attacks at the same time, because guess what? You don't eat, <laughs> you're going to have less heart attacks. And there's other mechanisms involved as well. Uh, same thing with SGLT2 inhibitors like Jardians and Farsiga. What happens is they basically pee out the sugar so the sugar doesn't stick in the system and their blood pressure comes down and other indices comes down and it, as a result, it reduces cardiovascular risk. Now, what's the problem with that approach, right? Let's use medications. Well, here's the problem with that approach. They cost us a lot of money. So it's like you lost your bicycle and you go buy a Ferrari to go from A to B. Okay, well, can you afford that, right? Yeah, Ferrari can get the job done. I'm not saying it can't, but then we are the one paying for all those expenses and our, we pay $300 billion for diabetes-related expenses every year. Now, we can't put that money into our education. We can't put into, uh, into our de technology and development instead of paying for these medications that we don't have to if we fix the problem at an early stage as preventative measures, right? Um, that's why, you know, yes, medications, if somebody have to have medications and they are not going to change their lifestyle, I'm glad we have those medications. I'm not against those medications, but I think it is premature to jump, put people on insulin or put people on these medications too quickly before giving them a chance to do changes in their lifestyle and so forth. I totally agree with you. It's one thing if somebody's taking a medication because that's the only way and they have some, we don't even need to use a specific disease or disorder, but it's another thing when the information we're talking about today is out there. And of course, we need the right people to come in contact with that information. They need the motivation. They need to come across it before it's too far down the rabbit hole. But for a lot of people, there are things, again, coming back to what we're talking about today, that they can do. So it's like, let's get to the root of this and get you healthy in general, fix your metabolism and save money. It's a win-win-win all around. Correct. Exactly. And that needs a lot of education. And here's the problem with the system. Our healthcare system does not pay for education. You will see on my YouTube channel, everybody complains, oh, you know, I'm so glad I found you because my doctor never talks any of these things, right? Why would he? Think about this. The doctor is there. He is there to make a living. And he's forced to see so many patients to maintain his salary, okay? You as a person, you have a job. Everybody has a job. Doctor has a job too. And they're not incentivized to give people education. They're incentivized to give push medications. They're incentivized to see more people. So as a result, those people don't have anywhere to go for education. Insurance companies don't pay for education. They will pay for a heart surgery for $300,000, but they are not going to pay a doctor to sit down and talk to their patients like $100 for 30 minutes. They are not, they're going to refuse to pay for that. And that's a huge system problem.
And everybody knows. You think the doctors don't know these are the facts? They know these are the facts. They know that if they change their lifestyle, they will do better. They know ketogenic diet will work. They know low-carb diet will work. They just don't get paid for talking about those things. They just simply don't. And they rather give the medication. And insurance companies will say this. Look, if your A1C is not down by three months, we are not going to pay you. you know, Or we are going to cut back on your reimbursement. So you better get this done right now. What's he going to do? He's going to pull the to, to insulin because that's the fastest way to bring the blood sugars down because he doesn't have time to preach the patient. He doesn't have time to educate the patient. He's just going to say, yeah, just, let's use our big guns. Let's get it done. And that's a huge system problem that they do a better job, by the way, in the UK, for example, in European countries in terms of preventative medicine. But in the United States, we are not even close to that. And with the workforce of so, so many, you know, we, we really lack, there's a significant shortage of doctors. And with that being in mind, and doctors, family doctors, and endocrinologists are not getting paid for educating their patients for metabolic health, I don't see that getting fixed anytime soon. But do you really feel like most doctors are aware at this level we're discussing today? Because I feel like a lot of the focus in the medical world is on the blood sugar, and we're taking it to the root with this conversation and talking about insulin and how a big part of the insulin piece is the fact that things can go on for a long period of time in the body and insulin can be awry behind the scenes and we're not measuring it, causing all kinds of haywire and destruction. Do you feel like most doctors are aware of that when they're you know, prescribing so, drugs, just trying to bring the blood sugar down? Yeah. Yeah, so I agree with that. So what happens is um, the doctors have general information about uh, dietary changes, what, what can help the patients, but they don't necessarily have in-depth knowledge about insulin resistance and consequences of the things we talked today about that I may try to make it more simple. I know that because sometimes I will talk to other physicians, I give talks and stuff, and they they look at me as if they are hearing those things first time. You know, I can't see on their face. <laughs> So uh, to me, it should be a common knowledge. But to your point, yes, I'm not sure if all the doctors are in tune with in-depth knowledge about the consequences of insulin resistance. Um, most of the time, they either forget, maybe in a busy life, you know, they're in a busy schedule and they don't necessarily go back and look at their data um, and study it again. And like I said, they get busy with prescribing medications and diet becomes just something supplementary, not the main thing. And that should change because 90% of our health is relying on our diet. Um, but like I said, even in medical school, they don't teach that. that, that much. I mean, I, I personally started studying this around, you know, five to eight years ago. The, uh, the dietary approaches and holistic approaches. Before that, I was just another doctor who just thinks about medicine and just wants to prescribe medicine. Uh, they have to open their eyes and uh, have a different perspective and try to understand more about insulin resistance if they want to save their patients. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. It's never too late, but the earlier you start, instead of postponing, the better to reverse diabetes.